Studies, which is which is focused on using facility-based housing to address needs. Um, we'll get started in just a moment. Just going to give a few minutes, or not even a minute, a few seconds, to let attendees get into the room. Hey, welcome again, everyone. My name is Liz Stewart. Um, I'm with the Technical Assistance Collaborative and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. Before we, we begin, I'd like to cover a few logistics on this next slide. Uh, given the large number of folks we have uh, joining us today, all attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions about any of the material presented during the webinar, please submit those questions in the Q&A box, which is located on the right side of the screen. If you have any technical issues, please put that in the chat box, also located on the right side of the screen, and send those directly to Michael Harmon Fields, who is another tech person providing tech support today. We'd also love for you to use the chat to share any insights or experiences you have related to today's topic. Um, and just so you know, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the HUD Exchange. Um, and the three other webinars in the series have, are actually already up there. And um, in a moment, I'll add that um, information to the chat. Next slide. We are joined today by Kate Burdell, uh, the Management Analyst in the Office of HIV AIDS Housing at HUD. Kate will be available to answer questions throughout the webinar. We also have some great expert panelists presenting today, including Juliana Bilowich, the Director of Housing Operations and Policy at Leading Age, Gretchen Van Ness, Executive Director of LGBTQ Senior Housing, Carmen Chung, Senior Developer at Penn Rose, and Alex Spanko, Director of Communications and Marketing at the Green Housing Project. Now we'll launch a quick poll to get a sense of who is joining us in the audience. And Michael, could you go ahead and launch those polling questions? Um, first is just who is joining us today. Just let us know if you're a HOPA grantee, a HOPA project sponsor or subrecipient, HUD staff or other. And um, also feel free to uh, introduce yourselves in the chat. And whenever we get a good enough response, um, feel free to go ahead and share those results, Michael. So about 38% are HOPA grantee, 28% HOPA project sponsor or subrecipient, another 26% fall into other category. And then we have a few HUD staff, jo staff joining us, which is great. Um, can we go ahead and launch um, the next question as well? How familiar are you with resources in your community that serve older adults and elders? Very familiar, moderately familiar, slightly familiar, not at all familiar. I think we can share that. Um, it looks like um, about, share those results, about 59% of you are moderately familiar, 27% slightly familiar, 10% very familiar, and 4% not at all familiar. So for those of you that are very familiar, I'd love for you to share some of those resources in the chat as you're hearing from our presenters today. Um, and hopefully, um, those of you that are only slightly or not at all familiar, get a better sense of some of the resources that may be available in your community. And then let's go ahead and launch, launch that last poll. That's more specific to today's topic of facility-based housing. Do you have relationships with senior housing owners and or developers in your community?
And again, whenever you want to share that, those results. Liz, you're not seeing them on your screen? I'm not. For some reason, it stopped showing it for me. But if you want to, if someone could just say what they are. Yeah, I got you. Uh, so 40% said yes. 50% said no, 10% said not sure. Okay. Again, for those of you that might have those connections, would love to hear um, how that's working in your community. Uh, now let's quickly just go through today's agenda. On the next slide, we're gonna hear from HUD about their 3R vision and the intent of the HIV aging and webinar series. Then I'll be doing a brief overview of facility-based housing before we get into the bulk of the webinar, which is hearing from our wonderful panelists that have um, are joining us. And again, they have a ton of expertise in the area of senior housing. So looking forward to hearing their presentations. Um, Kit, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Great, thanks Liz. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as you're all familiar, I'm sure at this point with our Reset Renew Recharge Initiative in the Office of HIV AIDS Housing, and it's intended to help communities achieve program excellence and, um, <clears throat> sorry, positive community impact to, and to ensure that programs are designed to meet the changing needs of the modern HIV epidemic, promote equity for all um, with living with HIV, and to underscore the importance of client-centered low barrier housing and services. Um, the past few years have brought many challenges for our HOPLA grantees, project sponsors, and the thousands of low-income households impacted by HIV uh, throughout the country. And as you know, the global COVID-19 pandemic stopped us in our tracks for many months, and we're still feeling the impacts of that today. That other virus caused us to rethink everything about the way we interact, the way we work, and even the places we live. So as we have moved out of that public health emergency declaration, what better time to reset? The three R strategy is a chance to restart HOPLA modernization work. <clears throat> the five year phase in period is over. So we should reset our planning based on the newest budget projections and our local HIV data. Modernization was a key focus for us for many years before the pandemic. And it's time to restart and reset our attention to that important planning and implementation. It's also a great time to renew now, to refresh the way that our programs operate by focusing on ways to adapt program activities based on lessons learned over the past few years and on new information like you'll learn today. And we feel like it's a great time to recharge. This looks like building grantee and project sponsor capacity, improving coordination between health and housing, and even working to ensure that the needs of older people with HIV, those 50 and over, and other long-term survivors are understood and that we're working to meet those needs. Next slide, please. We established a vision, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We established a vision for this work that embraces the importance of a sound HOPLA program, an equitable HOPLA program, and a needs-based HOPLA program. Beyond having a vision, the work of the 3R initiative will move us toward outcomes that will make a difference in the lives of people assisted by the program. This includes things like HOPLA communities intentionally integrating people with lived experience in all aspects of their work in a meaningful way and that HOPLA communities will embrace an expanded vision for the HOPLA program, one that shows understanding of the intents of the program, its connection to health outcomes, and ending the HIV epidemic. So the big picture we anticipate that HOPLA communities will collaboratively design and implement HOPLA programs that follow the regulations and understand the flexibilities, while also providing permanent housing and services in an equitable fashion, and we'll be able to accurately report on all these efforts. Next slide, please. So this HIV and aging webinar series has been intended to provide uh, information to help with grantees, project sponsors, interested field office staff, and the general public about resources that may be a benefit to older adults living with HIV in their communities. We've um, come to the fourth one that is uh, that we have promoted, but we are anticipating a fifth one coming in um, later days of August or early September. Uh, stay tuned for more details. Next slide, please. So today, 
more than 50% of people living with HIV in the U.S. are over the age of 50. Um, and this is why we are doing this webinar series, because this is something to celebrate, right? This is something we hadn't anticipated at the beginning of the epidemic, the HIV epidemic, and it's certainly something uh, we're excited about. But as folks age, um, they need resources, uh, because it's projected that by 2030, 70% of people with HIV in the U.S. would be 50 or older. And um, as people have increasingly long lifespans, um, again, they'll need more resources. So last year, your end of year reporting data shows us that in the past five years, um, the HOPLA client population age 51 and older has increased from 37% to 46% overall. And again, I apologize, that was the last five years worth of data. HOPLA grantees and project sponsors need to be working to address the emerging needs of their aging clients. And in service of that, um, I wanna stop talking and get to our presenters. So I'm gonna turn it back to Liz. Thanks, Kate. Um, and now I'm going to do a brief overview of facility-based housing just to provide a larger context for the presentations you'll be hearing today. Next slide, please. As we know, the older population is projected to grow rapidly, and although many seniors wish to remain in their homes for as long as possible, challenges exist related to affordability, accessibility, and poor linkages to health services. Nationwide, we are dealing with housing shortages, and this is particularly true for housing that can adequately address the housing needs of an increasingly older population. And for this reason, and those that um, Kate had mentioned earlier, Hopper grantees and project sponsors, along with community partners, should be considering how to expand supply of facility-based housing options for people aging with HIV that can address their unique needs. Next slide. So what do we mean um, when we say facility-based housing? Generally speaking, when we reference facility-based housing in the context of HOPWA and more broadly, we're referring to housing where the subsidy assistance is attached to a specific project, property, or facility and does not move with the participant or the tenant. In the HOPWA program, funds can be used for facility-based housing in a, in a number of ways, including master leasing units, um, providing operating costs and facilities, providing project-based rental assistance, providing capital funds for the acquisition, rehab, conversion, lease, and repair of facilities to provide housing and services. And then lastly, to provide capital funds for the new construction of SRO units or community residences. And within any of these eligible uses of funding, the type of building or property assisted could be configured in a variety of ways and have other funding sources and other populations being served. The HOPWA funds could just assist a certain number of HOPWA households in units in a larger development. So that's important to remember um, as you hear some of the resources and models talked about today. Next slide. There are a number of benefits to use HOPWA to create facility-based housing. It can create a more permanent supply of housing for people living with HIV since the units remain designated for HOPWA households. And as I just mentioned, the assistance can be used with other funding streams to develop a rehab housing, which can potentially stretch your HOPWA money further. And it's an opportunity to increase access to assess accessible units, which we know is a need for many of the folks aging with HIV. And it also presents an opportunity to improve coordination and access to needed services since there will be a number of units assisted at one property. Next slide. Developing facility-based housing involves a number of elements, but generally there's going to be a need for funding and partnerships to provide capital to build the housing, um, uh, to pay for the ongoing operating needs, and to provide the necessary services. And there are a multitude of federal and state and local and private resources that can assist with these. And we'll be hearing more specifics about some of those that have been used for senior housing um, specifically. But I wanna offer here that as a HOPA grantee and project sponsor, um, HOPA can be a partner in a variety of ways by either paying for one of these components or being a partner advocate in other ways to ensure that there is facility-based housing being built if that's a need in your community. And I think we know that it is a need in most communities. Um, on this next slide, um, there are just some additional resources and um, in a second, I'll add those to the chat. Um, so HOPWA has actually provided 
webinar and fact sheet on using HOPA dollars for capital. Um, HUD um, has a website on increasing the supply of affordable housing, and that goes into a lot of the different federal resources that are out there. And then SAGE's National Housing Initiative um, has some specific trainings on developing housing, um, in particular housing that is inclusive. And so one, I'll put those links in, but definitely um, encourage you to go um, look at those resources. Uh, but for today's presentation, um, you know, again, we have some great presenters today that are going to share a lot of information about senior housing resources and specific examples and models um, of developments for seniors that could really be for the people that you serve in the HAPA program. Um, so now I'd like to hand it over to our first presenter, Juliana Bilowich. They are the Director of Housing Operations and Policy at Leading Age. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all. Um, let's see. So I'll just wait a moment for my for my slides to come up. But right. Uh, so as as you heard, I'm with uh, Leading Age, which is a national organization that represents uh, the whole continuum of aging services. So what is aging services? Right. We see that as anything from uh, from home and community based services to um, senior housing to assisted living, nursing home, hospice. Right. That whole continuum. And I specialize in that small piece, <laughs> which is housing and um, specifically affordable senior housing. Um, so I've I've called this place-based uh, affordable senior housing, right? In the HUD space, we often call it project-based. Um, I'm I'm hearing it uh, from from you all, also facilities-based, right? So that all means the same thing. <laughs> um, and and so today I'm going to just talk you through a little bit of um, how we view um, affordable senior housing in the, in the project-based or or place-based um, uh, space. Uh, next slide. So just to, just to look at the agenda. So we're going to talk about a HUD program called HUD Section 202. And, uh, and so I'll get to what that is, right? I know some of you are familiar, some of you maybe not. Um, and, and we'll talk about how HUD Section 202 aids in um, the aging and community um, and how, how folks can access that housing, how folks can access services in that housing so that they can age in community, um, and then what's on the horizon um, for HUD Section 202. So next slide, um, I think we can actually, yeah, skip over. You got to love the stock photos they give me to work with. Okay, so we're going to start this segment um, with a question. How does America house older adults with low incomes? So we're not looking at people who are aging with HIV yet, right? We're just looking in general, how does America house older adults um, who need affordable housing? Right. Um, and and Liz actually shared a, a little bit about this already. So thank you, Liz. <laughs> um, next slide. Something that we hear a lot about, right, is Section 8 vouchers. So often when people hear Section 8, they think vouchers. And what are vouchers? Vouchers are um, a tenant-based, so not a project-based or a place-based approach, right? They're a tenant-based, they're a person-based housing subsidy. Um, that means that they are aimed at the demand. So some one, you know, one person, one household needs affordable housing, they get a voucher to offset that cost. So they, they can go to a, uh, to, to a landlord or, or other uh, place to, to rent housing with that voucher. What it doesn't do is address the supply, right? It doesn't do anything to create more housing just to offset the cost for that one person's demand. This is why we also have place-based or, or project-based housing. Next slide. And I think I mess up the, yeah, the font, sorry about this. The font is like got really tiny on the slide. Sorry about that. Um, so if you can't, if you can read it, it says public housing. So public housing is another really well-known program. And that's the, that's the, um, the project based or the place-based counterpart to, to vouchers, right? And that's directly funded and administered um, by the by the federal government. And interestingly enough, more than half of public housing households are headed by someone who's an older adult or a person with a disability, right? So even these programs that are not specifically designated for elderly are still um, uh, majority um, headed by somebody who's an older adult or a person with a disability. So that's interesting. Okay, next slide. 
we've talked about these two kinds of really well-known housing programs that HUD runs, right? But now I want to talk about, and these are just a little bit less common, commonly referred to, right? Um, and we call them project-based housing. In parentheses there, you'll see I put um, multifamily housing, right? So that's another word for it versus public housing. So multifamily housing, what is it? Um, how does it differ, right? And <laughs> how can you help folks get access to it? So we're going to talk about all of that. What is it? So this is that counterpart, right? So it's not tenant-based, it's project-based, meaning the supply, the, the subsidy is going to increase the supply of affordable housing. So HUD contracts with private owners to develop and operate. Those are the two, two pieces, right? Two key pieces, both the, the developing of housing and also the operating of housing, right? Um, that, that is affordable. And that's um, and that and we need a lot more of that, right? So we we are huge proponents of, of this model. Um, and the the private owners that that had contracts with can be either for profit or nonprofit um, in the in this project based space. Um, there are affordability requirements and restrictions, uh, right? And then HUD pays the difference in rent between you know, what is affordable to that household and what is deemed the market rent for that, for that unit. Next slide. So once again, we see that even within, um, within multifamily housing, right, two thirds of this type of housing, it's also called PBRA, project-based rental assistance, are headed by older adults or, or with people or, or by people with, with disabilities. Um, and within them, there are two really key programs that we're gonna talk about today. And one is, again, HUD section 202, um, my, my favorite program, <laughs> that's supportive housing for the elderly. So that's specifically designated housing for older adults with low incomes. And that program, the the, the the people that had contracts with to run that that housing, right, have to be nonprofits. So this is a nonprofit only um, uh, run, run space. And then you also have HUD project-based Section 8. Remember, we heard about Section 8 vouchers, right? This is project-based Section 8. So again, the subsidy is going toward, toward addressing the supply. Um, and that can be elderly designated or not. And that can also be a mix of for-profit and nonprofit um, housing providers. Next slide. So let's just take a couple slides here and delve into HUD Section 202 more specifically um, to see if this is something that you can help connect folks with that you are working with through, um, through HOPWA. So HUD Section 202, we often call this HUD's flagship senior housing program, right? It's the only uh, federal housing program that's specifically designed for older adults. Um, and it has a few unique attributes compared to other HUD rental assistance programs. So first of all, right, as its name suggests, it's for older adults only, right? So um, the household must be headed by somebody who's 62 or older. Um, it's also It also has more income targeting. What does that mean? It means that the folks um, who live there to be eligible, you need to earn less than 50% of that area's median income versus some of the other HUD programs. You can earn up to 80%, for example, of the median income and still qualify to live there. So what does that say? That says that HUD Section 202 has, has a deeper income targeting. Um, rents are capped at roughly 30% of that household's income. Uh, that income is adjusted by certain things, right? Medical deductions and, and whatnot. But in general, we say 30%. And what that means really is that you can't be too poor to live in HUD Section 202. And I want to call that out because some of some of the other pro, some of the other programs that um, are used to house people in America have you, you can actually be too poor to live there, right? So, for example, um, you, some people may have heard of the housing tax credit program, right? Low income housing tax credits, which is another main driver of affordable housing in the country, um, has affordability bans, right? And that means if your income goes down, your rent doesn't go down. Right, versus Section 202, where if your income changes, um, your rent is always capped at 30% of whatever that income is, even if it's a fixed income, et cetera. Um, so so it's, a, it's a truly affordable program, which is great. <laughs> okay, next slide. So let's look at what does HUD Section 202 look like today? And I have to tell you, I'm using the word today very loosely because we don't have great uh, data. We don't have great up-to-date data, um, meaning that some of these numbers are, are, are a number of years old at this point. But 
um, average annual income in HUD Section 202, just over $14,000 per year, right? So, um, so uh, uh, this, hence the, the deep income targeting, 17% um, of HUD Section 202 residents are over 80 years old. Um, that number has actually since grown, right? The proportion has, has since grown. Um, and, and remember eligibility is 62 and over. Um, and, and we see that growing proportion of folks who are in the older, older adult category. Uh, almost half are non-white, and the and 38 percent. Although this number again is a is a number of years old now, and we assume that it has grown. Um, 38 percent of Section 202 residents are considered frail or near frail, and that refers to their um, activities of daily living needs, so ADL needs, IADL needs, right? So the way that they can function to um, to uh, to age independently. Next slide. So. Now that we have this context of, you know, how do we house folks right through through HUD rental assistance programs, um, and in particular older adults uh, with low incomes, let's look at what it takes to aid for, for for these households to truly age in community. Uh, next slide, please. And what we're looking at is, you know, what kind of housing is really needed uh, to house this population. So that's that's the question for for this next segment. Um, next slide, please. So let's start off by looking at resident health needs, and I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here, but approximately two thirds of HUD assisted residents in, in this rental assistance space, and again, not just Section 202, but all the all these different types of rental assistance are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. What does that mean, right? Why am I talking about healthcare? Well, uh, Medicare and Medicaid are the eligibility is different for both of those programs, right? And you can be duly eligible for both of them. And one of them has a financial uh, eligibility criteria, more or less, and one has an age based eligibility criteria. So this tells you more than two thirds of HUD assisted residents have both this have fall into both this category of financial uh, need and age based um, eligibility and need. Next slide, please. The oh, and this one I think we need to click through. Who, whoever's running the slides, thank you. So there's a couple more bullet points here. Um, so the other thing that we are starting to look a lot more closely at in um, in housing, especially in housing for older adults and and for people with disabilities, is that the accessibility of the housing. Right, we have availability, we have affordability, but do we have the accessibility, right? And we know that um, that the country is lacking. So 5% of the U.S. housing stock is considered accessible versus roughly 26% of the population that is living with a disability. Um, and this refer, the 5% refers to simple features that are needed to accommodate a person with just a moderate mobility difficulty. And so if we add in a more severe mobility difficulty or, or limitation, then that brings the number down to 1%, for example, of the housing stock that's accessible to wheelchair users. Next slide, please. So when we look at how to um, how to house people with um, who are older adults, people with disabilities, people with health needs, right? We look at um, you know can the housing act as a platform, as a vehicle for services? Um, does the design of the housing meet cross disability needs um, and and age appropriate uh, needs in its in its universal design? So that's a lot of the emphasis. And next slide, please. What we find often or not again, yeah, thank you. Um, as we said, right, this program is designed that you can't be too poor to live there. But and if you could click through a couple more bullet points. We have found, right, that a lot of folks struggle uh, when they become ill, if they become more limited, um, another bullet point, please, um, if they become more, more limited or, uh, or, or uh, in, in their, oops, in their mobility, et cetera. Um, so we find that sometimes this housing can't meet all those needs, right, because it's independent housing. So let's look at how folks are, are getting around that, right, what housing providers and service providers are doing to meet those needs. Um, uh, next slide, I think we can go on to the next one. So this is all about services and service coordination. And the question for this segment is, how do we house people with services needs? And conversely, right, how do we bring services into HUD housing, HUD being an agency that focuses so much on, on the, the bricks and mortar on the, on the actual housing? 
Uh, next slide. So as I said, this is independent living, right? Um, and if you could click through a few few bullet points. Um, so generally, HUD, generally housing providers that are receiving this project-based rental assistance uh, subsidy, right, for for the how for for the for the housing community are not allowed to use the funds for what are called non-shelter services. Um, what what are non-shelter services, right? That could be um, that could be a service coordinator. So, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Somebody who coordinates um, and refers services for the folks who live there. Um, it could mean meal programs. It could mean um, transportation to the grocery store. It could mean a, a program that comes in to bring you know age appropriate nutrition classes or things like that, right? Um, so so most of the time, uh, fun, HUD funds in these spaces cannot be used to create what we'll call a general culture of wellness um, at the community. So that's really difficult. And that means that housing providers rely often on partnerships to make the space more service enriched. And I think some of the, some of the other speakers will talk more about that. Now, there are some exceptions. Next slide. Um, and I already mentioned service coordination programs, right? These are a truly vital, uh, th these are truly vital programs that exist only in Section 202 and some project-based Section 8 that are el elderly uh, designated. And again, they connect residents to resources um, in the community, but they cannot, in the broader community, but they cannot provide direct service or, or personal care. Um, next slide. Uh, there are some new grants for, for service coordinators coming out this year, which we are thrilled about because less than half of Section 202 uh, properties currently have one, and they really um, they do make the difference between somebody being able to age uh, in that community longer versus uh, premature institutionalization, for example. Um, next slide. These next couple of slides uh, just go over a couple other examples, some kind some 202s can access a supportive services fee, uh, which is calculated per unit and can provide some of those resident services that can, it can even provide, you know, health and mental health um, services, um, those nutrition classes, transportation options that I mentioned before, right, and some of that is already baked into section project-based Section 8 rent setting. So, so there are some options. Um, next slide. And then once again, just that reliance on partnerships to make the space more, more service enriched. Okay, next slide. So these next couple slides talk about um, how people access Section 202 housing, um, who pe people who are looking for housing, right? And we hear this all the time, right? Folks um, are no longer able to live in the homes that they've lived in, um, or they have some life event that changes their financial situation, and they are urgently in need of um, affordable housing that's designed for for older adults, right? That's that's service enriched, um, that allows folks to to age independently in community. Next slide. So unfortunately, a lot of these programs are hard to access. In general, HUD rental assistance programs fall short of the demand, right? It's not a, um, an entitlement program like some of the healthcare programs that we have in this country, meaning that just because you are financially eligible for the housing doesn't mean that you'll get it, right? Because there is just nowhere near enough. So we hear of years long wait lists, right? Um, and even in some cases, we know that people die waiting to access Section 202 housing. So there's a, there's a great need. Um, not only that, right, not only the limit in general on what's out there, but it's also the system is, is hard for people, individuals to access, right? As I mentioned before, this is set up a, in a private ownership structure. So there's no overarching body that manages where all of these um, in independent housing communities are. There's no there's no one door that folks can enter and get access to a list of all of them, right? Well, HUD, HUD has some lists, but if you want to apply to live at these uh, communities, you'd have to apply at each one individually. So um, you could use some of the HUD lists that exist and um, and apply uh, depending on your on your geographic locations uh, location. As I said, there are wait lists. Um, there are there can be some tenant preferences, meaning that the, um, a housing community could establish a preference for an older adult who was experiencing homelessness previously or, or another waitlist um, preference like that that could help people jump up higher on the list um, and get access to housing sooner. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and again, I, I mentioned the availability limit. So only 36% roughly of the folks who are eligible for this housing receive it. Um, and, you know, we are seeing this kind of growing uh, and alarming uh, homelessness uh, rates among older adults. Um, and we also see, you know, a growing need for intergenerational housing. So, so we have a lot of need. Next slide. Um, and the question here is, right, how, what can we do about it? How can we expand access? Next slide. And so Leading Age has some priorities around this, right? We, our main goal, because of the numbers that I've talked about today, uh, our main goal is to expand and preserve the affordable housing, the, the affordable senior housing units that we already have, right? Um, so expansion and preservation, top goal. And then and then in addition, we need to expand the services, the service coordination, um, just the, you know, the ability of folks to age in these properties once they do get access to them. Um, and then we have goals that, that relate to uh, internet connectivity, right? Um, climate resilience and energy efficiency. And then again, the accessibility and the partnerships that help these communities and the people who live there thrive. And just a couple anecdotes here about what HUD is, what else HUD is up to in terms of improving these programs. Next slide. Uh, we've been following a, um, a HUD effort to update what are called Section 504 regulations, which will make the uh, the housing more accessible, right? It'll change accessibility rules. So um, that that's a big that's a long time coming to to update those rules, and that would be a a, a big help. Um, next slide. The other um, big change that's kind of on the horizon is that HUD is updating their um, criminal background screening rules uh, that allow currently allow housing providers to screen out folks with certain criminal backgrounds um, from accessing housing. So two, two changes that are coming. Next slide. Um, and another slide. Uh, so the question now is um, how can we work together, right, to, to achieve these things, to build more partnerships, to build more housing, um, to make the housing more accessible, right? Um, next slide. Where we're at today, many of the Section 202 properties are older, right? So this program has been around a while now. Um, a lot of properties have matured or maturing 40-year mortgages. Um, HUD currently continues to pay that operating subsidy on those properties and has expanded some ways that those properties can undergo preservation work, right? So they can access recapitalization opportunities uh, so that the so that we can retain that, that housing, right? That gets back to the, the preservation issue. So that's preserving the Section 202 program. And then in terms of expanding it, um, and I'll show a, a slide in a, in a moment that, that um, gives you a visual of this, but uh, funding for new Section 202 homes took a little hiatus, uh, right? It's funded by Congress um, and was not a priority for, for a number of years. Um, restarted in 2019. So we were thrilled about that. And as Liz was saying before I spoke, this includes a couple of things, right? It doesn't just include the money to build new housing, but also the ongoing subsidy and in some cases, some services funding, right? So we're, we're thrilled with, with, uh, with the fact that the Section 202 dollars uh, started back up for new construction. Um, and, uh, and they do rely heavily on leveraging. And I think we'll hear some examples from other speakers that talk about how they've had to pair that money with other funding sources like tax credits um, so that they can they can um, they can leverage leverage other dollars to, to do the construction. So let's look at the next slide and this will give you a visual of where we're at um, with section 202 funding from Congress right and the numbers itself are probably a little too small for you to see but look at that line right <laughs> a little rough <laughs> um, the numbers dropped to zero. Uh, for, for a number of years and just in 2019 uh, have started kind of climbing back up um, that this chart ends at, at, at uh, it not it's 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 not totally up to date so we, we need to add a few more years but um, we're we're climbing our way back up 
Okay, next slide, just a quick look at how leading age addresses this. We have a, a big presence on the Hill. This is just from, from one month in, in April, our, the number of congressional meetings we held about affordable senior housing and, and the services needs around it, right? Um, the number of folks that we take with us to the Hill um, to make sure that lawmakers are not just hearing from me and my colleagues, but um, hearing from you um, and hearing from the people on the ground, the people that this most affects um, uh, the, the need for the need for more affordable senior housing. Um, and then the next slide here, uh, last slide for me, I think, is just how you connect with us, right? So Leading Age is a member-driven organization, and um, we have a network of folks who um, meet weekly, actually, <laughs> that's wild to me, <laughs> um, from all across the country to talk about how, how their affordable senior housing community is, is, is doing, how the residents are faring, how they can make it better, right? And then we also have work groups. So feel free to reach out um, if you'd like to, to get involved. Um, and I think the next slide is just a, a thank you. So I appreciate everything you're doing and I'll turn it back over to you, Liz. Thank you, Juliana, um, for all of that information. And um, again, folks, feel free to um, submit questions through the Q&A, or if you do have experience with 202, um, you know, feel free to share that in the chat as well. Our next presenters we have are Gretchen Van Ness um, with LGBTQ Senior Housing, as well as Carmen Chung with Penn Rose. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you both to talk about your partnership. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you everyone for um, including us today. We've had a, a tough week on Capitol Hill, but we are still fighting for the, the funding that um, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley um, had gotten into the uh, HUD appropriations bill last week, and that was stri stricken with um, the community centers in Pennsylvania. You might have heard about all of that. But I'm Gretchen Van Ness, Executive Director of LGBTQ Senior Housing in Boston. I'm very happy to be appearing with our partner from Penrose, Carmen Chung. Uh, today, and we will want to tell you about um, the Pride, the very first LGBTQ welcoming affordable senior housing that we are in the process of constructing right now in Boston, and it will be the very first in all of New England. So we're very, very excited to be making history to begin to fill some of the tremendous, huge, critical need that uh, Juliana and Liz have so um so touchfully, so, so powerfully laid out for us. So um, here are some of the architectural renderings of the Pride. So we'll take a look at the next slide, please. Uh, we, our mission is uh, as the sole nonprofit in the uh, all of New England and perhaps the whole country devoted um, simply to creating LGBTQ welcoming affordable senior housing. We know that there are many organizations that do this as part of their mission to serve um, the LGBTQ community um, and to create affordable and senior housing, but um, we were incorporated in 2018 as a nonprofit uh, with this being our sole mission. Next slide, please. This is just a quick overview of the leadership, our incredible board of directors and um, gerontology advisor. Next slide, please. And a little bit of an overview about um, our state. In Massachusetts, we estimate that we have about 65,000 um, older LGBTQ adults. Um, and we know from the studies that have shown again and again that LGBTQ older adults tend to be in not in as, as good health as um, our straight counterpoints. We tend to have um, financial insecurity, difficulty paying for housing and food. It's more likely that we suffer depression through isolation, no surprise, um, and are more at risk for falls and injuries. So there are lots of reasons to, to do the kind of housing that we're talking about today. Next slide, please. And the reason for this is that not surprisingly, the L people who are in the um, elder community and the LGBTQ community today are the folks who grew up before there were any legal protections for our community, um, when every mainstream religion condemned us, when every mainstream medical organization said that we were mentally ill, when it was you know, likely that you would lo lose your family, community, your housing, your job if you came out. So there's a lifetime of financial instability and housing instability that many of our elders today are still have still not recovered from, not to mention the HIV and AIDS crisis where so many people lost um, support systems, lost their partners. And since um, the pandemic, that epidemic happened before equal marriage. 
if your partner owned the house that you were living in and that person died, you lost your home. Um, so there were all kinds of reasons that LGBTQ elders today are um, face housing and financial insecurity. Next slide, please. So our key issues as uh, we are looking at serving the LGBTQ um, olders is to make sure that we reduce um, social isolation, build strong communities, have social activities and culture that are culturally competent, wonderful, fabulous, everything that um, our community is and uh, the individuals who are members of our community, that we actually have trauma-informed services, including addressing the needs of people with AIDS. Um, it's pretty amazing. I was, a, as I often say, I was a baby lawyer in the came out of law school in the height of the AIDS epidemic. And the fact that we are now be able to talk about serving um, folks who have had AIDS for 20 or 30 years and are healthy and well as older adults is something that was unimaginable to us back in that time. Um, so we're very much looking forward to being part of that effort. Um, we also look at uh, transit as, as another important uh, aspect of building community and ending isolation and making sure that we have the kinds of programs and services that folks need not just to live and thrive, but also to plan for how they, um, how they will age in place. Next slide, please. So the um, Pride is our very first community. It's a, a, the, in the former Barton Rogers Middle School in the middle of the Hard, Hyde Park neighborhood of Boston. This is a school that was built at the turn of the last century. It's a beautiful old building that was closed as a school back in 2015 and just sort of sat neglected until uh, we were able to, to buy it from the city of Boston. Uh, it's a historic renovation of this building and it a, preserves a landmark that is dear to the hearts of folks who uh, not only went to school there, but folks who live in Hyde Park, um, just a few blocks away from uh, the center of town. The upgrades and the uh, adaptive reuse um, are part of a historic preservation of this building and are very green um, and we're able to make the building 100% accessible in all of our units and apartments are designed uh, with universal accessibility principles. Next slide, please. Our partner in this work is the amazing Penrose. Uh, we have, we were one of the luckiest things we ever did was find uh, them in the process of beginning to uh, identify potential sites for building uh, the first LGBTQ welcoming affordable senior housing in Boston. And they have been with us every step of the way, turning this building into something that's gonna be an amazing community. They have a national reach um, and are creating affordable and workforce housing across the country and have experience in other communities as well, creating LGBTQ welcoming affordable senior housing. So Carmen can talk more about that. Uh, but there's a picture of, our, of the building as it's under construction. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our future residents, we are still about six months away or we sort of don't really quite know. It's an old building and the construction is, is proceeding as quickly as possible, but it's about six months away from opening our doors to our first residents. Uh, apartments will be awarded through a fair housing lottery that's conducted by the city of Boston. And it's a uh, senior housing that if there are individual members in the community that need support services of a particular kind, we're gonna help in every way that they have those support services. Um, and we know that this need is, is significant. We have 74 units and already over 900 people on an email list who've expressed interest in the pride. So we hear from not only people in greater Boston, but from people across the country who are isolated and alone wherever they are in the closet struggling to survive, uh, not, even, not even a question of thriving, um, who need the kind of housing that we are creating at the Pride. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just some of our hopes and dreams for, the, um, for our community. The process of, of creating the Pride has been a 10 year journey of speaking and connecting with all of the LGBTQ organizations in greater Boston and Massachusetts. Uh, connecting with senior services organizations across the city, working with the Hyde Park community specifically about what they would like in the space to develop and a vision for the pride as 
affordable senior housing where folks can live as their authentic selves, have the programming and services that they want, and also um, be outward facing and connect with the community. So the process of developing the proposal for the pride and the, and the dream and plan for the pride involved lots and lots of neighborhood meeting, lot meetings and community meetings. Um, and one of the things that we learned in all of this outreach to the Hyde Park community is that their folks really wanted a home for the 54th Regiment, which is an all volunteer historic reenactors group that honors the very first all black regiment that fought in the Civil War. If you ever saw the movie Glory, that's what that is all about. Uh, a lot of people don't know that 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 regiment mustered in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Boston, and the the historic volunteers who are continuing as reenactors, but also have the uh, the the papers and the various um, historic pieces of of implements and things like that, have no home. They've never had a permanent home, and they will have a home and space at the Pride as we also create a community space. So we are, um, and also if you've ever heard of the Grimke sisters, they too lived in Hyde Park, um, early suffragettes, as well as um, uh, working for the abolition of, of um, slavery in the, this country. So there's a lot of very interesting and important Hyde Park history that we'll celebrate as part of our building. Next slide, please. Um, here's a little bit of our timeline that just shows of uh, where we really started. We count 2015 as um, an important milestone in, the, in our journey, which was when the city of Boston held its first public hearing about the need for LGBTQ senior housing. And all along the way, we have involved community, uh, both our elected officials, community organizations, LGBTQ organizations, and are looking at, uh, hopefully, are holding our Fair Housing Lottery to award apartments this at the end of this year and opening our doors to our first residents next year. Next slide, please. And the need for um, LGBTQ senior housing that's welcoming and affordable to all was really impressed upon us last July and again this July. So we had our historic groundbreaking in June of 2022. The mayor, our member of Congress, uh, Congresswoman, Presley, state and city elected officials joined us. We had about a hundred, over a hundred people um, came to our groundbreaking in June and it was a phenomenal celebration and wonderful day. And then less than three weeks later, we were attacked by um, a vandal who spray painted anti-gay um, threats uh, and threats of violence on every single sign on our construction fronts that we had put up for the groundbreaking. Uh, it was a, one of the ugliest anti-gay attacks that I have seen in my life, and I have seen a lot as a lawyer who has worked on the front lines of our civil rights movement for decades. Um, but I can tell you that even though this happened and it answered the question, why do we need LGBTQ welcoming um, affordable senior housing? Um, by the end of the day of the morning that we discovered this on a Sunday morning in Hyde Park, over 120 people stood with us at the site in Hyde Park, brought their signs of love and acceptance and welcoming and put them up and covered all the hate on that on our on our signs that day and all the vandalism. So next slide, please. Uh, we're in the process of, of raising money uh, for our public community centers. So one of the things that we're most proud of about the Pride is that we will have community space, not just for um, LGBTQ community, but for neighbors and the greater Boston community. Hyde Park is a, a short on public space. So often community organizations and neighborhood organizations meet in the basement of the police station. So we will be changing that and making beautiful community center available. Um, and we also have no senior center in Hyde Park. So we'll become a de facto senior center for everyone. And there's no LGBTQ uh, community center in all of Boston, which is a terrible oversight. So we, we expect that our programming and services for our LGBTQ older adults will be intergenerational and help serve everyone, um, anyone who in greater Boston who wants to be part of LGBTQ programming. And we're also raising funds for the state-of-the-art AV and virtual um, infrastructures so that 
the folks that we haven't been able to welcome as residents would still be able to partake in our programming and services wherever they are, whatever language they, is their first language, whatever their ability as well. So we take very seriously um, our role as a community center um, to serve not just the folks who live in and around the pride, but all of our community as well. Uh, next slide. And Carmen, if you want to speak to um, any of the funding here, thank yeah. you. Great, thanks, Gretchen. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm Carmen Chung. I'm a senior developer with Penrose. Uh, I'm I'm the project manager for the Pride from the Penrose side, and we're a 50-year-old mixed-income affordable housing developer that works across the nation. Um, and this is not our first uh, LGBTQ affirming affordable housing project, and it's not going to be our last. Um, and we have. Uh, a number of projects across the nation now, one in Cincinnati that just opened earlier this year, another project at the works in New York, as well as uh, the John C. Anderson in uh, Philadelphia, which was our first. Um, and I think going back, we don't have to go back to the slide, but um, the slide that Gretchen showed about the timeline, um, I think Gretchen talked a lot about the need and I'll try to touch a little bit on the how uh, and that's probably another whole uh, presentation in itself, but the persistence and the commitment of uh, our partner has been really key. I think uh, we don't do any LGBTQ affirming projects without a partner because uh, we know that that's the key to making sure that we can make this a place that's truly welcoming because we can't speak for the community that we're not necessarily representing. So we need to have those voices at the table. Um, and I also want to thank Juliana for her presentation because there are a few things from hers that I wanted to really echo or from uh, theirs that I really wanted to echo. Um, and uh, one of it is the demand uh, for this. It, this will be a lottery. Uh, and we know that there is so much demand for housing in general. Uh, and there will be a specific demand for this. And uh, that list that Gretchen has put together will be uh, key to making sure that uh, we can make sure we have as many individuals who um, identify to help create this culture on that lottery as possible. Um, secondly, service coordination. The reason why LGBTQ Senior Housing Inc. is identifying and fundraising so much is because uh, that's exactly right. There is no uh, clear service dollars for services. And a lot of times our projects do rely on partnerships in order to deliver those services. Uh, but with Gretchen and her team's help, our goal is to really create a really robust array of services and fundraise so that we don't have to rely on partnerships that may ebb and flow through the years. Um, and this project is uh, financed through low-income housing tax credits, which Juliana, Juliana touched on earlier. Um, and uh, because of City of Boston funding, also this project will be affordable in perpetuity. Um, so it uh, allows for a range, uh, individuals of a range of incomes uh, to be able to qualify and live here. And we think that uh, creating that mix um, allows us to create more resilient and strong communities. Um, so because it's also a historic project, in addition to low income housing tax credits, we also have historic tax credits. Uh, we have a permanent loan on this project uh, that relies on uh, the operating funds in order to pay the debt service. Um, and uh, we have state funds as well as city funds. Um, and uh, from the beginning until now, and I think until we until we operate, um, Gretchen and her team will be continually fundraising to make sure that uh, this has all the resources it needs to be everything that um, we hope and dream for it to be. So uh, this is just a quick foray into the capital stack. You'll see that there's a lot of different sources of funds and a lot of different acronyms. Um, but this is oftentimes what it takes to cobble all the sources that are needed uh, in order to make projects work. And this is particularly difficult. Uh, as many people know, interest rates, construction costs. Um, so uh, even more so, we need, uh, we need to find more sources of funds oftentimes for ideals than we did five, six years ago. Um, but that's kind of uh, why the persistence and the commitment is important. Next slide, please. Yes. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, it's just a continuing uh, astonishment to those of us who are new to this process uh, for LGBTQ senior housing. This is our very first project, but as Carmen said, this will not be our last. 
and we look forward to continuing this the work that we do with Penrose. Um, but it's always astonishing to us what it takes to put, bring together the financing for affordable housing. And um, it was very sobering to hear that only 30% of 36% um, of of um, older adults who qualify are able to actually define the housing. So um, this is just a little bit of a, a list of some of the people that we are working with as we do outreach. As Carmen said, um, we are reaching out to every corner of the LGBTQ community to find all of the older adults who need the kind of um, affirming, safe, um, fabulous housing that we're creating at the Pride. We cannot ask people um, if they're a member of our community when they apply for the Fair Housing Lottery, um, but we're making it very clear in all of our outreach materials in the city of Boston's incredibly supportive of this as well, um, that this is the place for LGBTQ uh, older adults to apply if this is what if they want to, if they need affordable housing. And we want our allies to also apply and be there with us and folks that want to live in the kind of community that we're, we're creating. So we were very happy to choose a name for um, our project that, in, that incorporates Pride as well as the name Hyde Park. And it's uh, very happy to have the support of the Hyde Park community, um, which holds out our affordable housing project as a model for how it should be done. Um, all too often, affordable housing is seen as, as sort of a, a natural enemy with um, neighborhoods and business uh, districts, and we have had the exact opposite experience um, as we've developed the proposal for the Pride and as the construction is undergoing right now. So we're very, very happy to have a different sort of um, model for how we do this. Um, next slide, please. And then this is just some of our programming partners. We're very lucky in Massachusetts to live in a state with lots of um, well-established um, LGBTQ organizations, um, arts, culture, education, history, as well as to be in Hyde Park right next to the YMCA, walkable to uh, the library, to the business district, to Ron's Gourmet Ice Cream and Bowling. Um, so we're, we have incredible partners everywhere you look, and there's, this will be part of the programming that we have both on site and make, a, make accessible for our residents in um, through transit and other supports as well. And I, that might be it for us. I can't remember what our last slide is. Yes, that was it. So um, happy to uh, answer any questions at the end of this, whenever that we open up to questions. Thank you again for having us today. And this is just one example of uh, the kind of housing that we need so much more of. I didn't specifically mention that we are doing outreach to the um, HIV and AIDS community through HEARTH and the um, Fenway Institute, uh, all different, different places that support people with HIV and AIDS. We also have uh, set aside apartments for people who are currently experiencing homelessness so that they also have a shot at um, having a roof over their heads. And we're seeking in particular uh, grant funding to make sure that their apartments are outfitted with everything that they need. So we're doing a lot with this building that uh, to, to help serve our, every, every aspect of our community. So thank you again for having us. Thank you, Gretchen and Carmen, uh, for sharing just all this great work that you have been um, doing. And um, clearly there, yeah, there's definitely a need. And I hope those of you listening, check out the links that were shared um, to understand more about um, the project and, and the model and maybe how you can um, start working to do something similar in your community. Our next uh, presenter is Alex Spanko. Um, with the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Green Housing Project. And Alex, thanks for joining us today. Of course, thank you for having me. And um, this is such a wonderful opportunity. You know, I was reflecting on this and it's been mentioned before, but, you know, I'm of the age where when I was a kid and I was learning about HIV and AIDS, you know, this was something that was a death sentence uh, for people and there was not an expectation uh, that people would live very long. And so when I was invited to do this uh, presentation, I was really reflecting on how incredible it is that in my lifetime, and I know we have a lot of work uh, left to go in terms of equity and making sure everyone has access to treatments and supports. But the fact that this is happening in my lifetime and I could go from learning about this disease in school as this very scary, very finite thing, and then to be invited to speak and talk about how we can support uh, generations of, of older people who, who are living uh, healthily with HIV and AIDS, um, it was just a 
a, a great, uh, it, it made me think about how far we've come and it's, it's a minor miracle. And obviously, uh, Carmen and Gretchen, your presentation shows how much far <laughs> farther we need to go. Uh, I lived in Boston for about uh, five or six years in Jamaica Plain. So when I saw that news story about the, the hatred directed at that community, it was sickening, but it's also, um, it's heartening to hear that the community really rallied around it. And um, one of the things we believe at the Greenhouse Project is that what's good for people, uh, what's good for everyone is good for everyone, basically. What's good for people with disabilities is good for everyone. What's good for people uh, who are older is good for everyone. Because when you build a community where everyone is welcome and everyone feels at home, those benefits aren't just for maybe the marginalized group, that's for everybody. These are resources that exist to help everyone. And so this presentation that I give um, is called More Than Bricks and Mortar, because if you're familiar with the Greenhouse Project, you're probably aware, uh, familiar with the sort of what the buildings look like. So if you look at the next slide, um, oh, so this, sorry, let, this is my question, and I like to ask this question. It goes back to what I was saying about what's good for older people, people with HIV, people in marginalized groups is good for everyone. I want you all to think about what would you need if you needed to live in a communal setting for elder care or health care? What would you need to truly feel at home? And for me, I always say, you know, I would need a lot of books. I would need a comfortable space for friends and family to come and visit. I would need to not be woken up very early in the morning because I am a night owl. And I would need people who would know how to get uh, Mets baseball on the TV because that's one of my favorite pastimes is to watch the Mets. So that doesn't change. I don't anticipate a lot of those things changing as I get older and I would suspect it's the same for a lot of you. So if you think about that as we go through, I think it really helps set the scene. So next slide, please. So the Greenhouse Project, uh, you may have heard of us in the context of the pandemic um, because uh, the of the structure of the way the nursing home, of the way our homes are built. So very briefly, for the last 20 years, the Greenhouse Project has been the leader in radically redesigning nursing homes, assisted living communities, and other communal settings for elders. Um, so if you think about a traditional nursing home, this is the opposite of that. It's all small home living. We work with providers across the country. We have nearly 400 homes that are operated across 80 plus sites. We've been at it for 20 years. Uh, we're expanding internationally into Canada and Australia, although the vast majority of our homes are in the United States. And uh, I love putting that there because the workforce turnover at greenhouse homes, if you're at all familiar with one of the big challenges in nursing homes right now, it's staffing. Uh, turnover is four and a half times lower at greenhouse homes than traditional nursing homes. So these are places where people wanna live and people wanna work. Next slide, please. Um, we also have, these are very high level, significantly lower COVID infection and death rates, in more direct care time between caregivers and recipients of care, so elders who are living there, um, greater resident and family satisfaction, and actually savings to Medicare and Medicaid. So while this model may seem radically different, um, it's actually more efficient than sort of the traditional nursing home that you're probably picturing in your head right now. Um, next slide, please. So the Greenhouse Project operates on three principles, which is real home, meaningful life, and empowered staff. So that's why this presentation is called More Than Bricks and Mortar. If you've heard a news story about the Greenhouse Project during the pandemic, you probably were, the, the big takeaway was probably these are small homes, no more than 10 elders per home, excuse me, no more than 10 to 12 elders per home. Everyone has a private bathroom, private room, so you're not sharing rooms. And I always say that as an only child, I only ever had to share a room during college, and I never want to do it again <laughs> with anyone other than my wife, uh, because I don't. That to me is not home if you're sharing a room with a stranger. Uh, there's also a dedicated outdoor space, and there's an open uh, home style kitchen, so not a commercial kitchen, where the caregivers prepare the meals fresh every day. So it's not, you know, being made at a central location and being taken to your house, taken to your room that you share with another person. It's not like that. Um, so that's the real home part. We really don't like to say when people describe us as home-like, that's kind of a no-no because it's not home-like. It is a real home. That's where you live. Where you live is home. Um, meaningful life. So the elders are the center of life at greenhouse homes. If you've ever interacted with the long-term care system, you probably have seen that most nursing homes, assisted living communities uh, run at the convenience of the operator. Um, the whole point of the greenhouse model is that the elders themselves drive the rhythms of the day. If you want to be woken up at six in the morning to see the sunrise, you can do that. If you want to sleep until 11 and still have breakfast, you can also do that. And then the empowered staff. So they're universal caregivers. Uh, who perform their CNAs, and they're not just 
uh, doing sort of the traditional task of a certified nursing assistant, but they're also preparing the meals and doing the laundry. And it's a caregiving model that more closely models if you've ever provided care at home, um, whether it's to an older loved one, a child, a sick spouse, uh, you know that caregiving in real in real life doesn't work the way it does in a long-term care setting, right? You're not going around saying, okay, now I'm providing 0.2 hours of this type of care, and then I'm going to provide 0.5 hours of that kind of care, and then medication will come around in 10 minutes. You know, that's not how it works. Uh, you're folding clothes while you're asking how your loved one slept and if they need anything. You're cooking dinner while maybe you're also uh, making sure your mom or your kid took their medicine. So this more closely, you know, aligns with the rhythms of actual life. If there's a big flaw, if there's one overarching flaw with the way we do long-term care in this country, it's that we shoehorn it into a medical model where we know, especially during COVID, that health is more than just physical safety, physical health, medical health. It's about you know finding fulfillment, finding that meaningful life, finding connections with others. So next slide, please. So these are greenhouse homes. Uh, it might not look like a nursing home, but this, uh, these images here are nursing homes. Uh, this is kind of the flagship greenhouse style of nursing home, single family uh, style. Looks like a big oversized ranch house on a campus. Uh, next slide, please. I just love showing these big pictures because I think it helps. Um, there's also access to nature at all the greenhouse homes. That is a key principle. So you see there, there's walking paths, there's gardening. Um, residents can also go outside without asking permission. Uh, they have unfettered access to the outdoors, supervised, obviously, you know, there are people around, but you don't have to ask permission to go outside, which is something that I believe, I don't know the exact statistics, but there has been research that has shown that maybe 10% of people who live in long-term care settings have that ability to go outside without asking permission. Next slide. Uh, again, you're looking at these are rooms in a greenhouse home. That's a bedroom right there on the bottom left. On the top right, that's a communal area, sort of a screened in porch. Uh, but again, these are medical facilities, quote unquote. Next slide, please. And they're also adaptable. So the, the majority of the greenhouse homes in the country are sort of those single family style homes, 10 to 12 uh, bedrooms uh, and bathrooms, individual private ones per site. Um, and then on a campus, you know, there might be five, 10 of those homes for scale but it doesn't have to be a single family style. We have urban, suburban greenhouse homes. You can see in this picture here, um, that is a mid-rise uh, home in um, Alabama, I believe. Uh, so that's three stories. Each of those stories is its own greenhouse. And you can see what that would look like in principle uh, or in practice rather uh, on the left-hand side where you see the gentleman waiting for an elevator. Uh, the elevator doors open up and that is the front door of that greenhouse home. You have to ring the doorbell to be allowed in. Um, I'm sure many of you, if you've ever visited a nursing home, you know that the elevator doors open and uh, you're right in the middle of things. You're at a nurse's station. Things are beeping. People are running around. It's not like that at a greenhouse home. When I go, even though I work for the national organization, uh, when I go to a greenhouse home, I have to ring the doorbell and be let in uh, because I, you can't, I couldn't just walk into somebody's home. This is their home. Next slide, please. And so this is just a, a, an over, you know, a bird's eye view of one of our communities. This is in Little Rock, Arkansas. So you can see how from the air, I mean, maybe the houses look a little bigger than your traditional single family home, but you might not necessarily know that this is a place where people are receiving health care and other supports. Next slide, please. So again, it's more than bricks and mortar. It's about the universal caregiver. Um, that sort of care philosophy, pe putting people at the center of the decision-making, having meals together around a big table like you see, all of these factors play into the outcomes that we're able to achieve with greenhouse homes. Uh, next slide, please. This is where I really wanna get into the meat of things. And I know we only have about 15 minutes left, so I wanna make sure we have time uh, for questions. But um, the greenhouse model, I always like to say, any type of care or service that has been provided in a communal setting in the past can be provided in a greenhouse setting. It's not just for elder care. It's not just for nursing home care. So about 80% of the greenhouse homes are licensed as nursing homes, which means they receive Medicare and Medicaid funding and they uh, meet all of the federal and state standards for nursing homes. Um, but the remaining 20, there's a lot of creativity there. There's some assisted living and then there's some like the ones on screen that are adaptations for specific communities of people. So Tomei Rivertown is my favorite example of this. It's in Detroit. Um, several groups got together and they built uh, basically a hybrid elder care and housing center serving people on Medicaid. 
So there are three different services broadly pr provided there. There's affordable independent living subsidized um, under Medicaid. There's a greenhouse home for people who require additional services and supports, uh, but they can still live independently in their own rooms, bathrooms with, with all of the greenhouse amenities. And then there's also a PACE Center, which is um, the program for, ooh, uh, I, I'm not gonna, uh, all encompassing care for the elderly, I think. It's a federal program. Um, it's a wonderful program and we're huge supporters of it. It basically helps, uh, it allows states to shift away dollars that would normally only have to go to nursing home care to fund home and community-based services. So um, it's really cool. Um, we love PACE um, because, you know, so many people end up living in nursing homes because there's no other option for them that's Medicaid funded. So PACE kind of, it's a dollar follows the person kind of thing instead of a dollar follows the facility. So this is an incredible community where it really hits all of the factors that make a difference for elders. It allows them to live at the setting, the least restrictive setting possible. It provides a whole community of care and activities. You, the people who live in the greenhouse homes can go to the Pace Center. The Pace Center um, also accepts, uh, has people from the entire community. So you're building a network. There's no isolation. The, uh, the Pace Center includes a clinic, includes educational programming, transportation, activities, all sorts of stuff, all covered under Medicaid. It's a really cool, intentional community of care that they have built um, in right in downtown Detroit. And I encourage you to visit it if you ever get the chance. Um, the Leonard Florence Center is outside of Boston in Chelsea, Massachusetts, serves elders and people of all ages uh, with conditions such as ALS and MS. Uh, so uh, obviously a higher, more acute level of care, um, but the things that they do there for, um, uh, to really foster that sense of empowerment and a fulfilling life are incredible. If you can go on YouTube, uh, they took a bunch of people who were living with ALS and MS skydiving a bunch of years ago to fulfill uh, the lifelong dreams of many of their residents. The work they do there is incredible. And that's also a high rise model. So each floor, I think it's six or seven stories, each floor is its own self-contained greenhouse with its own self-contained care team. Um, and so they provide, they do a lot of different services there as well. And then finally, the Wyoming Life Resource Center. This is something that I, I'm really excited about. Uh, the state of Wyoming basically replaced a very old, I think it was 100, 100 years old, an institution uh, for uh, adults living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They replaced that with greenhouse homes. So this is uh, adult residential care for people uh, living with, uh, and it operates, I believe, under an ICF IDD, the federal standards. So again, anything that you, any type of care that traditionally had to be provided in sort of a hospital style building, um, it can be done at a greenhouse home. So uh, that's why I think this is such a great opportunity because as you see with the uh, Tomei Rivertown in particular, you can provide so many different layers of care, levels of care for people who need it for specialty populations. Uh, one of the things that uh, I find very frustrating about the way we talk about nursing home or elder care discourse is we tend to think of it as a binary option, right? You know, we can either have people live in nursing homes or they can live at home. There's no one size fits all option for everybody. Home care is incredible if you can afford it and you have a home to live in and an accessible home to live in and a network that can come to you. But for a lot of people, their housing is not equipped for that. Uh, they don't have family and friends nearby. I um, mean, it can be very isolating to live in home care. So I think uh, to live at home receiving care where your only visit is from a caregiver. I mean, imagine what that would be like for your life if the only person you ever saw was a doctor or a nurse who came by. It's not a very fulfilling life. So these are examples of how you can create intentional communities of care that meet people where they are, serve them. And in the case of Tomei Rivertown, totally Medicaid funded. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think I'm gonna end off on this one just because I wanna make sure I have time for questions. But um, here, there's sort of three flavors uh, of support that we're looking for, um, for fund that organizations look for for funding. Um, a lot of organizations are able to fund this with loans, with grants. Um, really, the only challenge is getting that startup capital funding for most organizations. Very briefly, there is not a lot of uh, new construction of nursing homes or uh, even assisted living facilities, but especially nursing homes. Pretty much every nursing home, most nursing homes in the United States were built within a, a 10, 15 year period uh, between the, the, in the 60s and 70s, right after Medicare and Medicaid were created as programs, because for the first time, uh, someone, the federal government was paying for these services. It wasn't out of pocket. Um, but that means that the median age of most nursing homes in this country is, you know, 45, 50 years old. These are outdated buildings. They're based on hospitals. Nobody wants to live there. 
Um, the greenhouse model, um, as I mentioned earlier, is operationally sound. Uh, it saves Medicare and Medicaid spending, specifically Medicare spending, because it reduces rehospitalizations for people, uh, because they're getting a better quality of care from people who know them a lot better um, in, a, in a setting where there are infection control um, you know, natural uh, infection control advantages from private rooms, which we saw during COVID, but also better quality of life, which leads to better health outcomes. So once you get that up and running, it's comparable or even less expensive, uh, but the capital expense is really where the, the challenge is. So these are kind of the three flavors that we're advocating for. One of them is uh, federal grants. Um, there have been some introduced in Congress, but as I'm sure you can imagine, you know, getting Congress to fund $30 billion for any new infrastructure project is very difficult. Um, there are some on the state level that would, you know, balance that need for capital funding with um, requirements as well to make sure that the money is going to where it's supposed to be, which we fully support. Um, we got to make sure that any increases in funding are actually going to resident care, new development. Um, state Medicaid rate add-ons, if you're not familiar, and this is a fact that always blows my mind to this day, but most people think Medicare will cover for cover long-term care. It will not. Um, about two thirds of people who live in nursing homes are covered under Medicaid. And that's strictly because either they were low income to begin with, or they spent down all of their savings um, and they really don't have any money uh, left. So they, uh, Medicaid kicks in. Uh, the Medicaid rates are very low in a lot of states. Um, most, a lot of lenders are uh, gun shy about lending against a Medicaid um, funded product. And so one of the areas is we're trying to get state Medicaid rate add-ons to encourage new investment. It worked in Arkansas about 15 years ago, actually, they were able to, in the state of Arkansas, they got a state plan amendment uh, through that added four to five dollars a day in Medicaid reimbursement for organizations that build small home style nursing homes. Um, and there are now uh, there's, there are now greenhouse homes all over the state of Arkansas, I think five, six or seven sites. Um, it's our biggest state now. So it really shows you how very small incentives can go a long way. And then also tax credits. Um, uh, that's something that the Tommy Rivertown community used. They were able to use a combination of, of federal tax credits, local development grants. As I'm sure everybody on the call knows, sometimes it can be a bit of an adventure piecing those all together. But they were able to do that. And then there's actually HUD plays a huge role in uh, lending to nursing homes, uh, to organizations that are looking to uh, acquire, renovate, build nursing homes through the 232 program. Uh, so we're looking for ways to incentivize that through the 232 program. But obviously uh, the HOPA program too presents an opportunity there for that startup capital for renovation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can just skip to the end here, although I will briefly say the Greenhouse Project recently merged with Pioneer Network, which is an organization dedicated to changing the culture of traditional um, uh, facilities, uh, healthcare facilities, including nursing homes and assisted living communities, really trying to take those principles of um, person-directed care, uh, empowered staff, uh, quality of life, and infusing that into traditional buildings. So we offer a whole range of services to organizations that are looking to do this kind of thing and provide these new kinds of communal housing. Um, so right there, you see on the screen, uh, the, our website, my email address, and the email address of my colleague, Kathleen Goff, who does a lot of our development work. I also put my email address in the chat because I would love to um, chat with organizations that are looking to do this or are just looking to figuring out where to start, because I think there's a huge opportunity here, you know, because we're kind of on this new frontier almost with uh, HIV and aging, we can rewrite the script. We don't have to make the same mistakes as we did in the past. We don't have to think that, okay, just by default, because you're getting older, you have to live in this dehumanizing type of institution. You don't have to. There are people who are working um, and have worked for decades to make things better and have that real home and real community for people as they age at any age and with any physical, mental, um, cognitive challenges. So uh, once again, thank you so much for the, taking the time today and I'm happy to answer any questions and um, uh, chat afterwards. So thank you again very much. Thank you, Alex. So we have about five minutes. I'm trying to see if we can get a question to each presenter. Um, Alex, there was a follow-up in the chat how challenging is it to find uh, the staff or team that are needed for these facilities, the caregivers specifically? Absolutely. Uh, that is a huge challenge that a lot of our partner organizations are working for. They are not immune to um, the staffing shortages. 
But what I will say is, again, I mentioned earlier that the greenhouse homes have turnover that's four and a half times lower than the national average. The national average in nursing homes, CNAs in particular, turn over more than once a year. So you know, you're talking about turnover of like 120%. At greenhouse homes, that's around 38. Um, it's still high for our liking, um, but it is uh, a lot lower than the national average. Part of that is uh, our values are that uh, because they, uh, our caregivers undergo additional training, uh, they need to be paid at a higher rate than a traditional CNA, so that goes into it. But there's also autonomy and respect that comes with working in the model. The CNAs themselves, the actual caregivers who do most of the one-on-one -on -one work, they are the ones driving the show. It's not a hierarchy the way it is in a traditional nursing home where you have your admin and your director of nursing and your RNs, and then all the way down at the bottom of the of the org chart are the CNAs. It's not like that at a greenhouse home. The CNAs are driving the care decisions. They are the core of the care team. And one of the best compliments that I get when we talk to our uh, caregivers in the field is, you know, I've worked at a traditional nursing home. I've worked at assisted living. I've worked at a greenhouse and I would never work anywhere else now that I've worked in a greenhouse. And so that's a huge part of what we do. And I'm happy to talk about it offline if you're, if you're curious. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, a question um, that I, no one's asked, but I know people have this question in their back of their mind. Um, for the folks at uh, the Pride, Gretchen and Carmen, um, I think a lot of the grantees, project sponsors joining, they know how to, they know how to serve, you know, the households in their programs, but they don't necessarily know how to develop housing. Um, where, where do you start if you don't have that kind of development experience? We see the long, that timeline and those resources that are up there. And I, I think probably some people are, you know, probably could feel overwhelmed by looking at that. Just kind of, if you can give us some words of wisdom on, on where to start. So, I, I mean, Gretchen, you can talk a little bit about LGBTQ Senior Housing Inc.'s search process. Um, but for from a developer standpoint, it's always starting with where. Like, where do you want this to happen? And are you in a community that will really enable that? Um, because we also want to make sure we don't put these seniors in a neighborhood that is not necessarily welcoming. So um, I think the where and what, what with what land is kind of oftentimes where from a developer standpoint, we start. And I think that um, we started with um, looking at all of the universe of possibilities um, and did pick Hyde Park, but also find your partners, just talk to people as much as you can. And I have to say, as we get closer and closer to opening our doors with the Pride, I know how um, we need to write up and provide some more information about how we did this so that uh, this is a model that's available to folks who want to do something like the Pride. And so we will be attending to creating that, um, that resource as well as we go forward. But um, yes, find, talk, talk to people like Penrose, talk to, pe talk to the, um, the, the, the service providers in your, and the LGBTQ community or just the community organizations in your community and find yourself a fantastic architect like Demela Schaefer that uh, I think those are the key pieces as well. Yeah, Gretchen, I think her team basically did a tour of one of our projects before they were like, this is what we want. Um, I think uh, vetting a developer is kind of a difficult thing to do, but I think the best thing you can do is visit one of their communities, uh, visit a green home, visit a Penrose project, because uh, those are really testaments to how they do what they do. Great. And um, Juliana, for the Section 202, you'd mentioned that there was some recent funding, um, and we know that it takes time to build. How, how could someone find out if any of that recent funding is in their community, and how could they you know, find the existing um, 202 owners out there if they want to connect with for like future opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of information online on HUD's website about the 202 program and the money that comes from Congress to build new um, Section 202 homes and to continue operating them. That has been on a yearly cycle. Um, we're actually anxiously awaiting the awards for this year's uh, 202 um, uh, notice of funding opportunity. So this should be out soon. And then the new awards will be announced. The availability of them will be announced in the fall and then folks can kind of partner on that on that annual cycle. Uh, but as Gretchen said, it's all about it's all about partnerships and figuring out who to who to connect with to, to make it happen. That's awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of you so much um, today for your great presentations. And sorry we didn't have more time for QA, but um, these materials will be available on the HUD Exchange. Um, 
for future reference, if you have any questions related to like what HOPWA could pay for in any development like these, you can always submit a question to the AEQ. Um, and again, we will be putting this um, this presentation online on the HUD exchange. And we thank you everyone for joining and for our wonderful presenters today. I hope everyone has a great day. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Alex and Julian. Great to appear with you. Let's do this again. <laughs> Take care.